So, as I begin this morning, I have a question for you. Uh, any Mr. Rogers fans in the house today? Anybody? Anybody? A few of you? Okay. Uh, I brought along my red cardigan sweater today. Um, yeah. And this is a very special sweater to me. It was given to me, uh, I think, the first year that I served at Beautiful Savior uh, at a Finnish Christmas festival uh, when Beautiful Savior was located in New Hope and uh, all the Finns, they wore red. And what did I know? <laughs> so they gave me this red sweater. And I think I became an honorary Finn. That was almost as important as the fact that my wife, Kristen, was from Wadena. <laughs> okay? And I became an honorary Finn. Uh, but I brought this along because whenever... I, I keep this in my office along with another cardigan sweater. I keep it for cold days or really, really hot days when Pastor Joe, who controls the thermostat in his office for my office as well, uh, makes it really cold on 95 degree days, uh, and, and it's still cold in the winter. We'll have to talk on Thursday. Anyway, uh, but whenever I put this on, if I walk up the hallway uh, for whatever reason and I run into folks who happen to be in the building, on that day, invariably, someone will say to me, it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood, pastor. <laughs> and you know what, folks? To be compared to Fred Rogers is one of the greatest compliments I could ever receive. Now, I didn't grow up with Mr. Rogers. I was too old for that. Okay, some of you uh, are old enough like me to remember this. I was a Captain Kangaroo kid, okay? That's who I grew up with. Uh, and being in Chicago, I also grew up at the end of each day with Garfield Goose and friends. Now, that probably means nothing to you except to Michael Bruder. Uh, not Michael Bruder, I'm sorry. To Michael there, uh, wrong family. South Side, right? Garfield Goose and Friends. Remember? You weren't a Garfield Goose guy? We'll have to talk about that too. He's also a White Sox fan, so we really don't live on the same city. <laughs> but anyway, Mr. Rogers has a, an amazing, amazing legacy of helping children and of advocating for the children of America through his uh, television show. And he also was a Presbyterian pastor. I don't know if you knew that. And there was a quote of his that I read this week that got me thinking about him and his sweaters. Uh, he was quoted in Christianity Today, a, a leading, well-respected uh, evangelical journal when he said this the things of God are deep and simple while the things of the world are shallow and complicated the things of God are deep and simple while the things of the world are shallow and complicated. And Peter's call to holiness in 1 Peter, the verses that Megan just read a few minutes ago, fit that bill. They are deep, but they're really simple. They're deep and simple at the same time because Peter says, he quotes Leviticus, by the way, with this. He says, it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. <sighs> and when God's holiness comes into the conversation, folks, that's so far off our radar screens, we can't even comprehend it. Wasn't always that way. 
At the creation, we were created holy. We are created perfect. We were created in the image of God. But then sin came into the world. You know the rest of the story, don't you? Actually, you live the rest of the story. You live the rest of the story every day. But the standard didn't change. God didn't relax his standard. Be holy as I am holy. Except we couldn't do it. And so God, amazingly, incredibly, and this is deep, God did it for us. God took on humanity's flesh and blood. God took on our skin. Our body. As we prayed this morning, God has so marvelously designed the ministry of both mortals and angels. But he didn't become an angel. He became a mortal. And he kept that law and he stayed holy all the way. All the way to death. And what he did was he took our sins upon himself so that we could be the children of God. And now he has joined us to himself in holy baptism. And he has come into our hearts, into our lives, into our minds, as unholy as they are. And he calls us his children. Folks, that's deep. That is really deep. In fact, it's deeper than any other religious system in the world. Because in every other religious system, people have to work their way to God. But in Christianity, God has come to people. And now he calls you holy. But that word holy, when it's applied to us, is not, here's the rules, follow them. That's not the holiness that Peter's writing about. It's from a gospel point of view. Holy means set apart, unique, peculiar. And that's what you are. You are set apart. Because if holiness is all about the rules, oh, folks, We can't measure up. We just can't. And when holiness becomes about the rules, that's when the culture's definition of many Christians really comes alive, doesn't it? And then you're accused of being holier than thou. You know all that means? Condescending arrogant. If that's how you wear your faith in a condescending way toward others, hear this word from God. Stop it. Just stop it. And that's a word from God. Holier than thou? Not a chance. Holy and set apart? That's God's gift. And set apart not to pray this prayer in the morning, Lord, show me all the rules and I'll get at it. But the prayer that says, Lord, you've set me apart, now use me. You've set me apart, now use me for your good and gracious purposes in my world. 
That's why you're different. You're different. Because by God's grace, you have faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. By God's grace, you have faith. And you're set apart. But there's another part to it. The verse right before, we read this one last week, but I have to go back to it because it's the bridge between last week's section of 1 Peter and this week's. This is verse 13 of 1 Peter 1. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Where does the mind come into this? Set your minds. Prepare your minds for action and being sober-minded. Folks, that's where the church comes in. This is why this is important. Why is it important to have life together? Why is it important to be a part of a Bible teaching congregation? Why is it part to be a place, uh, important to be a part of a place that brings God's word in both law and gospel? It's because there is a battle in the world. And this world wants you to change your mind. This world wants you to change your mind about Jesus. This world wants you to change your mind about our Lord Christ. And so we prepare our minds by being in the Word, by being in small groups, by being in worship. Folks, that's the gift of life together the encouragement to be prepared for what's to come this week. And you don't have any idea what's to come this week. Do you? Oh, I know you could whip out your phone and tell me every appointment you have. You have no idea what's going to come this week. Some of us sitting here don't even know we might be walking through the valley of the shadow of death this week. And so we prepare our minds and our hearts together. We prepare our minds and our hearts, and that gets translated into our lives as we live, as Peter says, as obedient children. Notice he doesn't say as obedient people, persons, servants, as obedient children. That's the relationship that we've been given. And God, God did not save you because you would become obedient. Because if that were true, that would be all about you, wouldn't it? We call that works righteousness. No, because God has saved you. You're obedient. Right? It's like our parents. And I know the analogy breaks down because parents aren't perfect. But they have to have us in order for us to be obedient children, right? Biologically or legally, adoption-wise. The relationship has to be established, otherwise you can't be obedient children. But God has established the relationship. And so we're called. We're called. We're holy. We're set apart. We're different. And maybe you don't want to be different. Think about it. Because you already are. You already are. By God's choice. And you know, I think Mr. Rogers 
might say, that's one of the things of God. Deep and simple. So, in our life together, let's go deep. Let's go deep. And let's stay simple. Every year, one of the great blessings in my life is to prepare sixth graders to receive the sacrament of Holy Communion. And part of that instruction is to share with them after they've been taught about the real presence and the true body and true blood being with the bread and the wine. I share with them a truth that I've always suspected they take with more than any other truth I share. Because when they come to this altar or any altar, what's really happening is that God is invading their space, coming into their place, even into their mouths. And what he's saying is this, I love you. And then I ask them a question. And if God does that for you and says, I love you, what might be an appropriate response of faith? Guess what it is? <laughs> Say it. I love you too. And maybe we can add to that. And I thank you. I love you and I thank you that I'm set apart. Please use me to accomplish your purposes today. So, let's not settle for shallow and complicated. Let's go for deep and simple together. Amen.